What program is that? Uh, so you're in a position to share education and knowledge about us, Anishinaabek people. Mm -hmm. um, if there isn't a name for the program specifically or that kind of thing, that's fine. Um, but if you are in a position or in a role where you talk about education, uh, is there a name to this? Uh, Eastern Door, um, Eastern Dora Indigenous Program. Okay, thank you. Uh, what are the age groups or the, the target groupings of people that this would apply to, this program? 18 to um, 90 years of age. Okay. What is the aim of the program? To have a better understanding of traditional knowledge. What happens in your program? We opened a meeting, we opened a program we open our circle. Our, our teaching model is a circle. We sit in a circle and we smudge to um, cleanse ourselves, to make ourselves ready for ceremony. We have um, a pipe, a community pipe that is um, opened in our group. And we um, bring the pipe, we load the pipe and smoke the pipe four times around the circle. And uh, we share. After the first round, the first round of the pipe is for prayer, be grateful for the day. And uh, the other three rounds of the pipe is open to questions, sharing, and uh, interactive listening and talking. And we use the feather to be able to have the permission to share. And we, um, we uh, follow um, the agenda of uh, Eastern Door um, programming. Thank you for, for telling us what was happening you know, what you can expect to go through. Mm -hmm. But is there a, a specific purpose of, of that program? If I walk away from that program, how, what am I happy with? My accomplishment. The use of the program is used in an incarceration setting. And uh, the main purpose of that program is to be able to understand and to participate in a ceremony where for about a, an hour and a half we can all forget that we're inside of a prison, a correctional setting. So while you and your participants are there, how do you and the participants measure success? Whew, it's measured in uh, quite a few ways. I guess, first off, everyone is equal. We sit in a circle to be able to initiate that thought. Uh, we are all equal. We are all the same. No one is ahead of anybody else. No one is above anybody else. No one is uh, uh, standing and somebody sitting. And uh, we are all either standing or all sitting. We all acknowledge each other the moment of uh, being able to share with uh, the handling of the feather, the eagle feather, the act that we're there to participate, the act that we're all open to the ceremony that takes place to open, to open up the prayers, open up the time for everyone to be able to share, the questions that are asked, the agreement that we're all going to be peaceful for the moment that we're in that, in front of the medicines, in front of the, the altar, in front of the sacred uh, items. Uh, no one is going to get personal and um, hurt somebody else. It's pretty unique because it is a prison. Inside a prison there is always act of no trust, no talking, and no love. The same thing that's e present in any abusive relationship, any abusive uh, actions that take place, they are present inside a prison. Don't talk, don't trust, don't love. So in that, in that aspect, where not to trust is present and taught, it is a, a success that we don't hurt each other anytime we're in that circle because we are all from different tribes, different parts of the country, uh, different, we're in there for different reasons. And I say we because I, I am a participant of that group and a leader of that group and a facilitator of that group.
sometimes places kind of grade success by being able to say their enrollment is growing. Um, is that a measure your program would acknowledge? Or is it kind of ebb and flow kind of participation? I guess statistics put together by the government identify that area. Uh, they encourage um, a lot of participants to uh, be there. Even though they limit the amount I can go, I still get anywhere from 5 to uh, 25. I've had up to 29 in my group, in one group. Uh, probably I wouldn't be um, exaggerating, but I would just say that I probably have the biggest group, the biggest groups in my programs than anywhere else that I've ever been. I do have a lot of people come to the group. So just so you know, like all of these, all of these, we'll call them some questions. Like we're still on, we're still on question one. What are the sub questions? The, I guess the last one we can talk about is, uh, what challenges have you faced, and how have you overcome them to make the program the success that it is? Uh, the different uh, dialects of the people that participate in Ojibwe, Cree, a Mohawk, a Oji Cree, a Cheyenne, and um, Odawa, the different tribes, understanding tribal relationships, understanding differences in background. We have urban, urban indigenous people, we have uh, uh, members of First Nations uh, people, we have uh, status uh, people. Now we're having a lot of um, Métis people come into our groups. There is um, a recognition of some people understand some of the languages. Some people barely speak English. A lot of people, it's the first time they're ever in program run by another native person. A lot of them don't understand and have never had any training in sweat lodges, uh, circles, uh, past piecing, they've never um, spoken their language, they've never heard their language spoken, they've never sat with a pipe, they've never used a feather. Some people have never understood the seven grandfather teachings. Some of them ask for grandfather teachings. I tell them I don't teach the seven grandfather teachings. Uh, you're supposed to acquire grandfather teachings through an observation of the person uh, modeling those teachings. Language is acquired, it's not necessarily taught. Our method of learning the Ojibwe language has gone by the wayside. Our greatest teacher uh, in conscience to each children has turned into a religious uh, figure, uh, Nana Bush, who now sits beside God up in heaven, according to a lot of people. Nana Bush was our uh, teacher of um, consequences to behavior. He's he no longer is recognized as such. I tried to bring that back to understand the act of uh, life is a journey, it's not a destination. Try to uh, understand that I'm not there to judge, criticize. I'm there to be a participant in a place where we all grow. What was the question again? So we were talking about um, what were the challenges of you developing the program? And then what, what was it that you did to kind of uh, overcome those challenges? I think the biggest part was to turn it into a participation program rather than a program where there was a presenter that uh, put down his ideas and uh, argued his ideas. It came to a, a sharing circle where people shared their thoughts, shared their emotional uh, feeling, uh, their feelings and so forth, and uh, shared the knowledge that they had. Uh, whether it was has to do with indigenous uh, traditional knowledge or knowledge of their daily lives, knowledge of crime. What was their what was their stance with crime? What did they have to share about their feelings of, towards crime? What did they have to share towards their feelings of what happened to some of them when they went to uh, school? What uh, what what they termed as civilized? What what did they think was civilized? And uh, answers to that. The challenges were 
in the programs themselves. The programs had been put together by non-native people for uh, native people. A lot of the programs that I, uh, I ran across were put together by non-native female people that were being directed towards male indigenous inmates. And uh, it didn't, it'd be like me trying to explain to someone how it felt like to be pregnant. It, uh, it doesn't jive. Mm. And a lot of the inmates were smart enough to say, I don't understand that. Why is that woman putting me into a box when I'm already inside a box? The, uh, the understanding of Western society and Western knowledge, it's um, put together with left brain knowledge towards people that have been in uh, trauma. When most people have been in trauma, it switches you to right brain dominance. So you have left brain people putting together a program to be directed towards right brain dominant people. How can that work? How can a left brain person understand that there's no such thing as time with uh, indigenous people? How can an indigenous person understand the importance of time when most of our knowledge is pretty well mnemonic and at, uh, atavistic in nature. We have uh, acquired, encoded knowledge right into our DNA because that's the way we've been for thousands of years. And all of a sudden we are being confronted with a 500-year-old language that, has to, that, that is supposed to understand all that stuff. And you can't explain that in English. So that's the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> I know you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, well, there's, there's many layers for sure. Um, so, so I, something I want to just dig a little deeper in terms of a challenge was you spoke about working with other nations like men mm -hmm. in, in, your, in your environment. Yeah. T tell me a little bit about the challenges of that and how you overcame those. Well, when you've had a language that uh, is basically nearest, nearest to the year I can put it at through um, fossil discovery and so forth, our language is about 13,000 years old, with 13,000 years of knowledge embedded and intertwined right into the language. We were talking about God, our relationship to God, 13,000 years ago, 11,000 years before the Bible came along. We had a relationship with God. We didn't, uh, we didn't have faith, we didn't have belief, because we didn't need them. We had knowledge. We, had, we knew God. We called them our relations. When we finished talking, anytime we were talking by a fire or anytime we were talking in, in ceremony, we, we ended that by saying to all my relations, talking about the grandfathers, talking about uh, our relationship to nature, which is creation. The Creator had put creation there. We had an understanding. Our drums, they were made to resonate, send messages across the universe. Even our um, measurements, they were um, subliminal knowledge that were right into our being. Uh, when, we, uh, when we were babies, we, I think uh, non-native people have their remembering their uh, focus. Um, they, uh, they think that they're remembering the dream, remembrance of their dream starts when they're about two years old. And their um, awareness of stimuli starts, they say, between 18 to 20 months. We measure our knowledge of um, stimuli to from inside our mother's womb. We listen to our heartbeat for nine months. We begin to regulate our lives to that heartbeat. When the mother goes to sleep, her heartbeat slows down. Baby goes to sleep in the in womb because he hears the heartbeat slow down. Anytime afterwards when you become a man, you listen to soft music that is slow, you fall asleep. That subliminal knowledge doesn't leave you. Anytime you're in an area where um, sound is faster than uh, the heartbeat, you, have, uh, you go into a frenzy. That's why there's riots at uh, some rock, uh, some rock, uh, rock music festival. Okay, people's spirit goes into a frenzy because they're listening to some music is faster than their heartbeat. It regulates. So they, they are taught with subliminal knowledge. Like Another example, I guess, would be how you um, how a, a baby is tied up in their chicken oven. 
baby has uh, tied up in a tikkunagan and they're, for, they're backwards and they're forward. They're tied up forward and they're behind their mother's back or their father's back so that they can look over their uh, parents' shoulders while they're doing, the parents are doing something. The little guy is watching what's going on. That's how baby learns. Eh? And sometimes the baby, if they're going to travel, the baby is tied backwards in the technology so that baby will know where he came from. He'll be able to see where he came from. So that if something ever happens over there, that baby will find their way back. Because he's the one that saw where they came from. A lot of our teachings are subliminal. Uh, the act of picking medicines, going with the grandmother, picking medicines. The knowledge stays in their mind. So when they get older, they're looking for something, they'll find that subliminal knowledge. I was raised that way, so that's why I know. Uh, when you're, um, I think when I was about uh, two, three years old, two and a half, three years old, my grandma told me that uh, puppies came from uh, pussy wells. I said, well, that's great. I said, my grandma, let's get one. She said, okay, well, you just sit there and you watch those pussy willows. And she says, when one of those things falls down and hits the ground, it becomes a puppy. She says, then you go and run and catch it. I ran and got that puppy. You know, I sat there and I sat there and I sat there and waiting for that pussy willow to fall. And any one of those pussy, there's a bunch of pussy willows. I sat there to watch one of those things fall down. Because we're going to run forward and catch it as soon as it fell. I sat there for three days. Even my grandmother bring, bring me sandwiches out there, uh, uh, scone biscuits and so forth. So, because I didn't want to leave because I might miss something. Eh? So I sat right there and watched. I got cold, I got a blanket, sat there and watched for that pistol because I really wanted that puppy. When uh, one morning I woke up, there was a sound at the door. And I said, what the heck is that? You know, something moaning away and everything like that and whining away. And I reached up to open that door and uh, unlatch it and opened it and unlatched it. And there was that little puppy there. I said, oh, he smoke. I was really happy. Hey, holy cow. Then I got really mad because I missed it. I missed it falling down off the tree, off the branch. My grandmother was teaching me with subliminal, subliminal magic. Always be ready to watch for magic. Keep your eyes open. Look for miracles. Look for magic in your life. And uh, you that stays with you for the rest of your life. You're always looking for exciting things, you know. Always looking for what's over the next hill. You always will, you know, what, what, seeing a strange... Uh, a strange person someplace when you walk in, you say hi to that person because that person could be somebody you know, you know. You want to find out later on who this person is. So you say, hello, how are you? And keep on going. You have, it's a habit you have for the rest of your life. So that's part of it, I guess. Thanks for sharing that. That takes us to number two. From your perspective, what is indigenous education? Indigenous education, something about plants. I always thought indigenous meant plants. Anyway. When he's talking about plants, he says, oh, that's indigenous to this area. Yeah. I guess indigenous knowledge or education to me would be, I guess, a teaching of perspective, teaching of um, mnemonic knowledge, uh, teaching of um, subliminal knowledge, to understand the, la the language, to understand the meaning of language, to know that there's um, a place where um, dreams happen. A lot of times, a lot of the knowledge that I hear talked about in, in group is um, understanding spiritual knowledge, understanding something that I've never heard in school, understanding spiritual abuse. One of the most abusive uh, natures in this world, and it's something that I've never heard talked about in school. I worked with a, I was a, supervising a, a student that was going after a master's in, in psychology or social work, social work and some psychology. And she says the things that I talked about in group, with the group, she had never heard being talked about in any of her classes. We talked about uh, spiritual abuse, the act of uh, hurting each other spiritually, the act of uh, making somebody invisible for days at a time, which is something else in another language, which is something else in another, in another uh, race. In our race, it seems to be um, minimizing somebody to a nothing. Some of the boys talk about partners not talking, to, not talking to them for days, and they talk about it as the most painful thing that happens to them. 
is not being acknowledged for days at a time. And some of them talk about the act of somebody disappearing, talking right by them, talking right past them, as if they're not there. And I see that a lot among our people. Some couples I know don't talk to each other for weeks. Some people I know in my First Nation uh, don't even acknowledge me when I, uh, when I walk by them. I talk, I should go on. And they just walk straight by. And uh, until I realized who was losing out, it used to bother me, but now I, at least I don't lose out. I notice everybody that goes walks by me. And because I was raised in, uh, in my language, and I spoke in my language all my life, my grandfather was able to teach me how it was that people fought each other spiritually through um, the use of uh, sexuality. There is a lot of abuse through the act of using sex as a power tool. They, they recognize that as, sex, as spiritual warfare when I was a kid. And when I was a kid, I saw lots of that. And uh, there's no training for it in a, in a, a school, a place of education. It's something that we learn through uh, ceremony. We learn through that through fasting. We learn that through meditation. And um, when we talk about it in group, some guys get really agitated. Just between someone screaming at you and someone not talking to you for days. It seems to be the one not talking to you for days is more bothersome than somebody screaming at you. They, they say that's the thing that's the scariest, is if someone minimizes you to a nothing. That is beyond abandonment. To a Anishinaabe person, emotional abandonment is more scarier than physical abandonment. That's why they say that's why they suffered so much when they were kids. Their parents were drunk, uh, drunk all the time, and they were emotionally, emotionally ignored. And they said that is one thing that hurt them the most, is to have somebody there but not acknowledge in their presence. That hurt more than being physically abused. If they were gone someplace and they weren't around, it didn't hurt as much as somebody being around and not noticing. So some of these guys, are, uh, you know, they're pretty, pretty big guys, and they cry and they talk about these things. Inside a prison, to be able to dare go there, has to be a lot of trust in that pipe, a lot of trust in that medicine, because... Without that, they couldn't do that. So that's, uh, that's, that's something that I thought I'd bring up. I don't know if I'm still on topic. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like uh, something that really kind of caught my, my attention was this idea of things not talked about. Like that, that, was, that was basically a quote that I heard you. Mm -hmm. And it, it re it's a good flow into one of the questions. And that question is... Uh, there's, there's stories and knowledge that's really good that we almost hear routinely. So keeping that in mind, what knowledge is important to you that you would like to pass on to the next generation? Kind of excluding those classic things that, that's constantly shared kind of in, in circles. Do you, do you think there's there's stories or knowledge out there that's important that isn't being shared currently? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think the the act of discipline used to be taught by aunties and uncles and uh, what we would term as godparents now, I guess. Even the word godparent, people don't know, don't understand that anymore. And um, the act of visiting today through what I've gone through, when we, when it was New Year's Eve, when it was New Year's Day, from that day for 10 days, people used to go visit each other. They would go to one house and then they would have dinner there, and they would go to the next house and they would have supper there. And then next day they would have breakfast at one place and dinner at the other place, and then they would have supper at the other place. They went and ate with every family in their community to renew a relationship. Whether it was good before, bad, or anything, they would still go to every house in the reserve and talk to each other and visit each other. Now, before that happened, before my generation, my grandmother used to go visit one year at a time other people in other, in other villages. She would go there and live there with other people for a year. Later on, when she became a medicine woman, a blower, 
she would go visit people for weeks at a time, stay there and use her medicine and uh, look after the people there. And uh, during my time, just when I was a little guy, they were still visiting each other in Sagamook, West Bay. But my home territory was Sagamook, where all my relatives were. And we'd be going there, and we'd go and visit. We were gone for a week or so. Go house to house, visit, eat with those families, visit with them. When I went back again when I was a teenager, 15, 16 years old, people didn't, didn't do that anymore. Uh, they had uh, evolved to where they were passing out apples or oranges or candy. You go visit somebody, knock on their door, you come to the door, and, here, here's an apple. Bye. You didn't go in the house anymore. You stopped at the door, took the apple, and we went. I was, uh, I was about 15 until I was about 18. We went. Most of the time there was, you didn't go someplace because they were drinking, so you didn't go there. As you didn't really want to get uh, anything more than an apple. So it was a lot of that visiting wasn't worth getting the apple anymore. And um, today, people don't visit each other anymore. There's one man in Bear Island, and I think there's about three houses in Massey, Sagamore. They still run outside and they shoot the, sh the shotgun off New Year's Eve. Boom. And they all have, Happy New Year. And they run back in the house. Uh, there's one house in uh, Bear Island. Was, uh, my wife's uh, dad goes outside New Year's Eve and shoots the gun off at midnight. Boom. It's the only guy that does it. Again, with the visiting, somebody comes over and sees him, he invites him in, and sits down and has a meal. Very, very few people. Today, people don't even know how to talk to each other anymore. Uh, rather than talk to somebody, uh, you text somebody. It's like throwing your hat into a house before you walk in. You don't know how to talk to anybody. Nobody knows how to visit. It's a, it's a, a thing okay, with our language. When I was a little guy in Sagamok, there was a guy named Nijwasa uh, Gijik in Sagamok. And um, my, my grandparents, my uncles, my aunties, they called, uh, they called this guy Nijwasa Gijik. So me, I spoke both languages. And when I was a little guy, um, some of the kids started to call this guy seven days because that's what Nijwasagijik stands for, seven days. So when they saw this old guy, he said, there are seven days, hey, seven days, seven days. So after I became an, an adult almost, like uh, 19, 20, 21, uh, the next generation behind me, they called this guy, hey, seven. <laughs> no more seven days, seven. <laughs> The evolving of the language <laughs> went from Nishnabe all the way to broke down English, all in one, all in my lifetime. I think if we, like, if we went back to having names that meant something, uh, like me, I was raised in Bidotum. My language meant something. My name was something, and um, I responded to it because it's who I was. Lorne is just a name; uh, it can be given to anybody. But there's only uh, one Bidotum that I know of or knew of. No more. So when somebody yelled, but you don't know, I knew it was me. <laughs> somebody could yell, John, and all those four guys jump up. <laughs> We're all named John. <laughs> One of them is just a John. <laughs> but that's the difference. In, you know, um, we used to have uh, names that went somewhere, identities. Uh, I guess uh, the, the visiting, being able to talk to each other, it's kind of one of the most important things. We don't know how to do that no more. We don't know how to feel good about ourselves inside. Some nowadays we we identify with each other by what car we drive, uh, what our house looks like. When I was a kid, lived in a little wee cabin in the bush, two years old, when I first had uh, cognitive recognition. Um, first thing I noticed was a nice little cabin way out in the bush. There was two people in there, me and my grandma, and uh, fire was crackling. And I had my own little bed, little short bed, and my grandpa was gone, and uh, I knew he was coming back. I didn't see him. When I first remember, I don't remember my grandpa being there, but I knew he was there, because he was gone when I started to remember. And uh, I didn't miss anybody for three months. I was back there with my grandparents. 
just me and Grandma most of the time. Never missed anybody. Uh, there was no music. There was no talking hardly except Grandma to me. Uh, no other kids, no nothing. But we visited. Even when we weren't talking to each other, we visited. It was a form of communication. You learn to think for yourself because there's nobody else. So I think uh, what, I'm, what I miss most of all is thinking in my language. When you think in your language and you pray in your language, there is always somebody listening. And I think that's what uh, non, non-speakers non miss. They miss out on that. Because if you speak your language and you think in your language, there is always somebody listening. There is always somebody listening. So when you pray, there is someone listening. And when you pray in my language and when you talk to God, when we have our circles, we go there to talk to God. We have a chaplain at that jail. They go to the chaplain. They go to the chapel. Four or five of them at a time go to the chapel. They go to church to talk about God. Every, every day they go to talk about God. We go to my circle. We talk to God. It's a big difference. In one, when you talk to God, you expect an answer. You expect that somebody's listening. When you talk about God, you're still talking about him as if he's not really there. When you come out of there, there is a big difference in how you think. You acknowledge God physically and spiritually. You talk. There is a reciprocation of thoughts and everything. It's a totally different experience. So I think being able to communicate to God is a, is a big thing. It's an important thing. There is a, a change in you when you subliminally get response. Yeah. So that would be what I would uh, probably like to see, something coming out of this. Yeah. A couple of things that I would like to know a little more about, and this has to do with uh, stories and teachings and thinking about your grandchildren great grandchildren the next uh, the, the next generations to come you brought up uh, you brought up Nana Bush mm-hmm. and you brought up your grandmother was a blower yeah. are there any particular stories or teachings from either your grandmother or Nana Bush that need to be heard that haven't been shared in the last while, I guess. Stories or teachings that you you would want to make sure are captured, I guess. I guess uh, what I experienced, I never made a mistake when I was a kid, right through till I was seven years old. When I was a little guy, I didn't make mistakes. I broke things, I ran into things, I um, forgot things, I um, locked the dog out by mistake. I never got in trouble. My grandparents never pointed out that I made a mistake. It was my second week of school. I wrote something down. One and one make three or something like that. There was a big X put beside my work. I had never been cognitively aware that you could make a mistake until that time. Even though I didn't do things according to the way I was supposed to do them, my grandmother or my grandfather watched me and I would make a mistake. And the only way I would make the mistake was that I saw that I had made a mistake. I did that. I saw that. And the only way I saw that was uh, my grandma sometimes would show me, is, uh, is this what you're looking for? Yeah. I'd break a glass or something. And she'd um, wipe it up. And then she'd put another glass in front of me. Yeah. And Because um, I'd be upset because I'd spilled my tea. i have been drinking tea since I was about two years old. Um, she says, oh, she says, here, tea there. So I'd, I'd be careful. I didn't... Uh, I didn't, I went off that down. I wasn't told I shouldn't be doing that. I, I, I didn't get shit uh, for tea, putting that tea down. Nothing. No, no mistake. And my little ones, Selena, Sam, I go out and I go out and shovel. A lot of snow, I go out and shovel. Sometimes they're lucky they'll catch me. I say, oh, jeez. They'll throw on their boots and nothing. They'll go out there. I'm going to help you. I say, okay, that'd be great. You know, to, to, uh, to order them to help me. No. To correct my kids, um, if they need it, if they ask for it, I'll do that. To correct them, I try not to do that. Because that's the way it made me really think about my life myself. I had room to, it seemed like I had more room, more room to come to my own decisions. More room to, to make mistakes. Because you got to make mistakes if you're going to learn something. you got to make mistakes. You don't make mistakes by doing things right. You make mistakes by doing things wrong. Um, I don't go to... Uh, work today and uh, turn around and uh, do a lot of preaching to a lot of guys. This is the way you should live like me. Quit drinking like I did. Don't do what you're doing. You're teaching them shame. You're not teaching them anything else. You're teaching them shame. 
we didn't learn. There's 150,000 kids I went to, to school. They learned they learned a correction through shame. They came back and they became adults. They had kids. They tell the kids, you should be ashamed of yourself. You should be more like your brother. You didn't learn anything from that. You learned to hate your brother. <laughs> hey, at least I, I, I learned to, learn to uh, hate my cousin because that's how my uncle talked to me sometimes. You should be ashamed. And my grandfather never said you should be ashamed of yourself. Never, never heard any of that. So you have a good feeling about yourself. I went through a, addiction, and I went through addiction because of the pipe. My grandmother taught me that I was going to be a pipe pipe carrier by the time I was nine years old. She said, you're going to be a pipe carrier. You were born with a shroud in your face, so you're going to be a pipe carrier. And they didn't, uh, they didn't put me out to fast when I was eight years old. My grandfather wanted me to go fast. My grandmother said, don't do that. You're going to kill that little boy. My grandpa said, what do you mean? She said, no, no, the people are going to kill that little boy. If you teach him, if you bring him out to class, they're going to kill that little boy. And my grandfather said, well, well why would they do that? And he said, you know why. There's nobody doing that anymore. They're going to be jealous of that little boy. Let him learn some of this stuff. Let him learn. But don't teach, don't, uh, don't go out to, don't, don't bring him out to class. Because people will kill him. Because they'll be so scared of him. He's going to be that powerful. He's going to be strong enough as it is. Don't put him out to class. So that's what they did to me. They wouldn't put me out to class. But they wanted, they said, well, we have to teach him to be a pipe carrier because he's going to be a pipe carrier. And so I heard that, but when you get to pipe teachings, I don't think anybody with half a brain would want to be a pipe carrier. Like most of the people I run into nowadays, uh, they want to be pipe carriers. Eh? Oh, I want to be a pipe carrier. Order pipe, pipes from internet, eh? Some of them are $95, some of them are $150, $350. They really want to be real strong pipe carriers. $750 pipe carrier. You can buy those. You ever see them? On the inter in the internet, they're, they're for sale. Some of them guys, they get honorarium for a thousand dollars a day, so they buy you know, a couple of pipes, put out their put out their bundle. There's here's one of my pipes here, and another pipe there. See how powerful I am? I got three of them. That's how that's how it's become. Because people, there's a different there's a different meaning to being a, a pipe carrier, a different meaning to being a, a an elder than when I was a kid. When I was a kid, uh, you, uh, you said, well, you know, you, if you carry a pipe, you're going to be the one to make sure everybody crosses over and they die. You're going to be the last one to cross over because you're working for uh, Mishomas. Mishomas is going to ask you to work. Make sure that everybody goes over. So you're a little young guy. You know, oh, not me, man. <laughs> Something happens when I'm going to be first one over there. <laughs> so you, uh, you do things so that you're not going to be chosen as a pipe carrier. So I started drinking pretty early because I didn't want to be a pipe carrier. And uh, it, uh, it took me to, uh, it took me right down to Skid Row. Because people still look for me when I was drinking and everything. People still look for me to ask me for help even when I was drinking. People would say, uh, do you know where there's a medicine man? We need a medicine man. My family's really sick. Do you know where he can get one? Said, oh, yeah. I'd be all drunk up. I'd say, yeah, I know where there's one. He said, well, could you, uh, what do we need to give you to get, uh, uh, to uh, take us to a pipe and, uh, to that healer? He said, well, you have to give me some tobacco. And what do we have to bring for the healer? And I said, well, you probably have to bring him some tobacco and some whiskey, and you probably have to bring him blankets or something, and uh, bring him some gifts. Uh, well, well, how, how, what do you, well how, how well do you, how well do you think you want to be? How much do you believe in uh, what you're asking me to do? That's how you got to, that's how, that's the presence you got to get that person. So they'd say, okay, well, we got to get quite a bit, I guess, because you know what you're doing, and I'd be drunk. And these people are still looking for me, and uh, especially not, because you know, they found out that my grandpa, my great uncle, He'd been one of the past, last ones to ever do a shaking tent ceremony in Norton. He was one of my great, great uncles. He was the last one to ever put a shaking tent ceremony out there. And uh, it ran in my family. My grandmother and my great uncles, two of them were shaking tent men. And they were expecting me to be a pipe kid. Oh, no, not me, man. <laughs> so I, I drank and uh, I found out by the time I was 25 that I could not get away from that. I would have to be a pipe carrier anyway, whether I sobered up or not, or whatever it was. They uh, they were intent on me being a pipe carrier, and so I started to change a little bit. By then, I'd have uh, I'd had uh, uh, three kids by that time, and I didn't know how to look after those kids. Tried to look after them, tried to look for work. I had worked and everything, still couldn't be able to say, okay, I'm not going to be drinking anymore, blah blah blah, and. and uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't do that. It's not because I didn't love my kids. It's simply because I was more scared of being a pipe carrier and somebody giving me a pipe because I didn't know how to be a pipe carrier. I thought you had to be something extra special to be a pipe carrier. And to this day, the, sta the same thing is there. 
uh, people say, well, you know, you're going to do this, Lord. And I say, okay, yeah, I can try that, but uh, I don't know. You know, that's uh, that's uh, that's what I went through. Now. Nana Bush, I knew that Nana Bush was a teacher. Nana Bush was a teacher, and he wasn't perfect. My grandmother introduced me to Nana Bush when I was very young. And Nana Bush, he made all kinds of mistakes. He tried to take a shortcut in a bush, and he was lost for days. Uh, Nana Bush went to uh, he went and made some soup, turtle soup, and put them and put it by the side after it boiled. He put it on the side a little bit, and he he asked his bum to look after his soup, make sure if somebody came near the soup, he'd uh, uh, his bum would wake him up. He said, "You wake me up if somebody comes near my soup." So he went to sleep. A little raccoon come along and what's this? He ate the soup. Nana Bush woke up because he was just putting it aside there, so sleep for a while, so his soup would cool down a little bit. Cool down, as a raccoon comes along, and eats all the soup. He was to eat his soup, and it's gone, so got really mad. So he went and squatted over the fire to burn his bum, and you know, punish his bum. And he, uh, he burnt his bum. So then he got, he, he got, he got, he, it really hurt him, so he ran through the bushes because it hurt so bad. And he ran across these branches, willows, they all turned red from his blood. They came red willows. Oh, he looks back and he says, "Oh, geez, let those red willows become the teacher of kids. Let those red willows become teachers of kids." So he ran over some more. He ran where his rocks. So he slid down the rocks, scratched his bum because his bum was starting to heal and get itchy. So he's sliding on the rocks for some. Some of the scabs came off, and you can see those scabs on the rocks today. And he said, "Okay," he said, "Let those scabs." Someday when the Shnabe is hungry, he can make those into soup. So that's why we have those scabs on the rocks there someday. Nanabush did die. Then, so. That's one of the stories. So he got into a lot of trouble, this guy. And when you're a little guy, I thought, well, he ain't going to do what that dude did. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you learned. Right. That's how you learned, uh, you know, consequences to behavior. And uh, he was a teacher. And that's how I was raised. All of his kids, my cousins, my second cousins, we all learned from the old ladies about Nana Bush. And if he sat there and listened to his stories, he said, holy smoke, you know, that guy is really something, boy. He's bad. <laughs> Kids came back from residential school, and they become adults. And they had a whole different story of Nana Bush. Nana Bush was perfect. They had Nana Bush stories. And they, all the other stories changed around. And then the, the stories came out where Nana Bush was perfect. Just like Jesus Christ. So you didn't hear the old stories anymore. Kids didn't learn anything from Nana Bush anymore. But they only listened because they wanted to see how bad this dude was. <laughs> they weren't going to do what he did. <laughs> but when he became perfect, kids didn't want to hear that anymore because they didn't. They knew they weren't perfect. So they didn't want to listen to the stories. Anymore. So kids changed. Kids changed because Nana Bush changed. He became a different kind of teacher. That's what I experienced. The language changed. The language for um, the word for uh, what we termed as a bad boy was mjigwuzans. We used that word, but the mjigwuzans, when you take it apart and uh, look at the inner inner things of banana, mjigwuzans. Uh, mjigwuzans means when you look at the little guy. The behavior you're looking at comes from somewhere. That little boy is not that behavior you're looking at. It comes from somewhere. Mm. That's what that, that's what that word says. But because there was a language to replace it, we said instead of jiggu's ends, we said bad boy. So jiggu's ends became bad boy, and bad boy became Jerusalem. So the language changed. Gunadza, mm. meaning crazy. When you look at the word gunadza. And you see or hear people saying, well, the guy's crazy. He's Gionadzima. You're misusing the word Gionadza again. Gionadza meant he didn't belong anywhere. He belongs everywhere, but he doesn't belong anywhere. That's what that word means. And that's exactly what Gionadza means. He doesn't belong anywhere, and yet he belongs everywhere. It doesn't mean crazy. It's just describing how a person that's mentally handicapped behaves, describing it to a team. Mm. It is not describing a crazy person. Uh, a crazy person is someone that's become insane, that's 
more, more of what uh, you're trying to say, but no, the, the language changed. Some of our languages started to change, and the people changed as a result. The way you treated a person that doesn't belong anywhere, when you became a crazy person, you changed how you behaved to that person. The person changed. When you looked at uh, Jigu's ass, when you called Jigu's ass, meaning he's a bad boy, the boy changed. Instead of the boy being someone that has different kind of behavior, he became the behavior. And we changed. When we changed the meaning of our language, we changed. When we said miigwech, miigwech means thank you. A lot of people will tell you, miigwech means thank you. It does not mean thank you. It means he gives, we receive. Uh, and I'll ask you, when you hear the word uh, miigwech, what do you what do you think is the difference? Well, if I say miigwech, it means he gives, we receive. That's what miigwech means. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between miigwech means thank you and miigwech he gives, we receive? Is there a difference? Uh, there was a time when I related to thank you, uh -huh. but then I heard the idea that well, it's not. If I say miigwech to you, I'm not addressing you. I'm I'm recognizing that it's the Creator who provided. So, like, I'm directing the miigwech to you, but I'm actually recognizing that the Creator had a part in whatever it is we were. So, how does that change you? How does, how does that change, change your behavior? behavior? How does it change my behavior? Expectations and so forth. Um, it's, it's hard for me to... Well, not really explain, but... Like, uh, I'm shifting the understanding that it was something that you did as a person to recognizing that creator had a role in that moment. Uh -huh. so, so that, like, that's that, that's how it changes me like uh, so you're acknowledging the abundance of creation rather than the abundance of the person yeah yeah I, like I guess ultimately I'm I'm respecting where it is I should be respecting as opposed to the act of an individual yeah, yeah. so there is a, a very definite thing the other one is uh the one that uh, is most profound a lot of times too is the word aningwana. When you, a lot of people say that there is no word, we don't really have any word for goodbye. But the really old people used to always say before they parted, they say aningwana, aningwana. Aningwana means that you've already accepted. The next time you see each other, it might not be here, it might be over there. You've already accepted that. So that when when you do part trails, you've already accepted that so it's okay. You've already acknowledged that, yeah, I guess the next time I'm going to see him is going to be over there. So they, uh, there is, in a sense, no word for goodbye because there is no goodbye except that the other guy's going to have a different address for a while. You know? <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what that signifies. So a lot of times when I hear that, <clears throat> like uh, people used to use it in ceremony, even in the circles, or I started to use that in my circle. And the guy said, you know, I feel different all day when I say that. And I said, well, that's what it's meant to do. It's meant to be a very spiritual understanding, a spiritual acceptance. That somebody is running this boat, and not you, basically. Mm. You know, that's basically what it is. Eh? So the understanding of the language and uh, to uh, to be able to use it the way we used to use it a long time ago before we understood another language. It changes, it seems to change our lives. It changed mine anyway, for sure, because the, the way that I I look at even what I drive, is what I drive is really not mine, it's something. The creation gave me a chance to be able to find a way to have that, to be able to use it to drive somewhere. But it's not mine, because I certainly ain't going to take it with me when I leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
that, and so it changes your it changes your thoughts. Yeah, I have heard you speak in, in another place before, and this conversation is reminding me of I don't remember where it was you were speaking, but you were talking about passing of Sema, and at some point you had said the old ones would never have used their left hand, and you related it to warrior societies. Yeah, well, uh, militia. A lot of our spiritual experience came from militia, having a war with each other. It, was, it wasn't about dying, it wasn't about killing. It was a spiritual involvement of the being. You fought with your enemy that you chose. The Apache used to honor certain people that were very, very, very good warriors. And they used to put medicine down, their kind of medicine, for this being. Because this being was going to be teaching a lot of young people, young warriors, because he was so good. A lot of young young Apaches were going to become very good warriors because this man was there. And these warriors would live a long time. So it had a lot to do with spirituality, spiritual being. Uh, it, uh, it wasn't uh, that it was violent, it was... It was a fact that it built you to be able to go into that next world, to be able to be whole when you went into the next world. So that's uh, basically the, the teaching there because uh, the traditions that went with that was to, when you offer tobacco with your left, you are showing that you don't have a, a spear, you don't have a shield, so that uh, you know that that person touch, trusts you because you, you, you're handing out the set on with the left. When you're handing out tobacco, or receiving tobacco at the right, you're showing you don't have a knife in your hand, so you know that person's not going to hurt you because he's using his right hand. It had to do with uh, uh, the militia. It's the same thing with the European people uh, that were in war. They uh, they used to lift up their lift up their shields on their on their helmets to acknowledge and show each other their eyes to acknowledge each other. They showed their eyes, so they don't wear a helmet no more, but they still. That's where that comes from. Mm. It comes from the yeah, old way of lifting up their helmet, lifting up their faceplate. And uh, a lot of our traditions come from militia. Um, the the way that we say that women can't, shouldn't be touching our stuff when we when we uh, when they're under time. A woman is on this world to give life. A man is on this world to take life. To be able to feed your family, you have to take life. To be able to protect your family, you have to take life. So a man's job is to take them. That's why your eyesight's good and, and your eyesight's really good is to be able to, to protect your family. If you're, uh, you're strong, protect your family. A woman, she's a nurturer. She's been put together to bring life into this world and to, con and to nurture her life, to feed her child, to change her child, to be able to hear the child. She's got super hearing so she can hear her child when her child needs her. She will wait to hear her... her Hearing is superior to a man, because man won't even hear nothing and just roll over and go to sleep. And the woman says, oh, my baby's crying. So there are two different uh, uh, ways of uh, expressing life, two different ways of experiencing life, man and woman. A woman uh, is, uh, is there to give life and to bring life into this world, to work in partnership with God. Because she's built in such a way that her hips spread and everything to bring life into this world. A man, a man could never su survive that. He's not built. Every human being that comes into this world comes through a woman to be in this world. So when a man is supposed to protect life and to, uh, to, to take life, to be able to protect family, his weapons, his tools, everything has to be in top shape. His uh, spears, his bow and arrows, his knives, his canoe, his snowshoes, his uh, quivers, his clothes have to be in top shape to be able to look after his family. A woman who gives life, when they touch the tools, her, her gift of giving life is stronger than a man's love to give life, to take life. So when she does that, she neutralizes his power because the power to protect life and to give life is stronger than to take life. So that is why women should not be touching man's things because they have both different reasons. Mm -hmm to be able to do what they have to do. Sometimes a guy will say, no, you shouldn't be coming here because you're, you're on your time. Says it in such a way almost to make it look like a woman's dirty when she's on her time. It's not that at all. It's because of that teaching.
Um, a woman has a way of a different way of expressing life. When you take a garbage out to the road, that's a chore. When your wife observes you taking garbage out, bring it to the road. To her, it's an act of love. Oh, he loves me. He's taking garbage out. He loves this family. He's taking garbage out. To you, you're a man. You don't know about that. You just not get rid of this stinky stuff. <laughs> uh, to a woman, it's an entirely different thing. A woman uh, has a, a very a very close relationship to processing. When a woman comes to you and says, well, that man, he uh, he called me a stupid uh, SLB, something like that. And that man, he just made me really mad when he did that and he hurt me. And you, you're a man. You say, well, I'll fucking fix him. Let me at him. Who is he? Uh, no, 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 no. I was just processing, honey. Take it easy. A man doesn't know that. A man doesn't know how to process. He knows how to fix things. He's broken. I'm going to go fix him. That's the two things the two things you learn. You know, we learned that in, in, in our group. Uh, wife battering is uh, some of the things we talk about in that group. A guy will say, well, you know, I'm a very possessive person, you know, and uh, sometimes I say some really mean things to my partner. And I that, that tobacco is bringing that feeling out, and that, that pipe is bringing out that feeling. I want to talk about that. And he'll talk about that. He says, you know, that's, that's how I am. And, and that's how I was raised. I was raised uh, in a very violent way. And I know that's not right. So when he opens up and everything, in a conventional Western treatment program, healing program, everybody's required to talk. If you don't share, in two weeks you're out of there. He said, get out. You're not, you're not providing, you're not producing here. Come back when you're ready. In a program that we try to do with the medicines and everything, when you open the door to something that's bothering you, you're not only healing yourself and opening your door, you're opening everybody's door because everybody's listening to you. Everybody can relate to what you're talking about because of the medicines in the pipe. You're open. You've opened up your mind. You've opened up your ears. You've opened up your eyes. So when a guy says, you know, uh, yeah, I am kind of possessive. You know, when when somebody looks at my woman, I get really freaking, freaking pissed off. Another guy says, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm the same way. How, how do you change that? See, when you talk, not everybody has to talk. There's some of us that talk. There's some of us that that learn by keeping quiet. Nobody is told to leave that group. When you start to misbehave or start to uh, behave in a different manner in a circle, in treatment, you're thrown out of the group because you're disrupting You're disrupting the group. Mm -hmm. In a, a circle where there's pipe uh, and medicines, uh, when you start to act out, the facilitator says, well, yeah, there you go. He's starting to heal. He's starting to think it's safe to open up. I'm going to let him do that. Because what he's talking about, the way he's behaving, he's affecting the whole group. The whole group has to change because he's forcing that change. Because if you're, if you're going to look at it the other way, where, uh, say, you're taking um, a medicine for, um, to cure uh, cancer, and one of the symptoms of uh, uh, your medicine working is uh, your hair starts to fall out and your skin starts to uh, scab and things like that. So how would you feel if they threw you out because your hair started to fall out because you have the cancer, the cancer medicine is starting to work? Your cancer is healed. Can, the way that cancer is healing, the way that shows that is your hair is starting to fall out. It shows that you're starting to heal. So how would you feel if oh, geez, your hair is falling out, get out of here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that basically, it's almost like you're just saying the same thing to a person that's acting out in a group and he's starting to heal mm -hmm. inside. So you want that person to be in and say, hey, boy, keep going. Give me some more of that. Mm -hmm. Let's see what this group... That's how I've had to understand that some of the challenges you were asking, you know, that you have to literally think backwards to the way you're taught in training. You literally have to think backwards. One guy's shutting up, he's not saying anything, but you can tell he's reacting because you can see it in his eyes, he's pretty nervous. And everything, but he knows he can't leave because he's got the pipe there. So he just, but he's hanging on for dear life, you know, because he's, he's feeling that. He's, he's participating, mm -hmm. but it's, the only thing is not from him, it's from here. So you learn those things because you say, wow, if he, if, if he would have been in my treatment program in Rainbow Lodge, I would have had to throw this guy out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the behavior to uh, treatment is different. The behavior to healing is different. Uh, the behavior to uh, like almost uh, Anishinaabe people, because they think in pictures, we 
have a whole different response to programming. When uh, if you're in an anger management program, what they call anger management, if you're thinking about it in Ojibwe, there is no such thing as anger management. No such thing. There cannot be. It's totally, totally impossible to be thinking about anger management. Because if you're managing anger, trying to manage anger, you're taking away one of your greatest gifts. Anger is a gift. If it wasn't, you wouldn't be having it. Do you understand? Mm. Yeah. So when uh, when you're uh, when when you're uh, looking at someone and saying, okay, well, he's very angry, and so forth. When I was working with the kids, doing circles with kids, I've never seen anybody come to me. One of the little kids come to me and says, "I came to your program because I think I've got a problem with anger." I've never seen that. What I always saw was kids coming to my program because somebody did not know how to put up with their anger. It was the adult somewhere that had a problem, not the kid. The kid was very well able to express how he was feeling, pissed off about what's happening to him. The only thing is the parent or the adult did not understand what this guy was trying to show. So when I uh, did the anger management program, when when you're looking at the usual training of anger management, you're looking at uh, pause response uh, and um, you're looking at um, stimuli. Stimuli, pause, response. That is what you're looking at. In, uh, in a violent home, your reflex memory to stimulus speeds up from five hundredths of a second to two hundredths of a second. That's how fast your response to anger is, or stimuli, I mean. Uh, what I had to do in order to work with kids is figure out how to slow down the stimuli, the, the, the response to stimuli, how to slow that down to its original speed. Instead of a two hundredths of a second, I had to uh, slow it down to two hundredths of a second, so they had still had the choice of how to react to the stimuli. So in other words, I had to find out for myself, I had to find out that there's stimulus, stimuli, pause, response. But the thing is different with Nishnabe people because it's stimuli, pause, response, review. But there is a review. 99% of our people are in prison because of the review. See, I walk into you someplace, I have a talk with you and we get into an argument. We get into an argument, we get into a, literally almost a fight. Okay, we're both sober. We don't want to hurt each other, we're thinking with our minds and everything. And we, we walk away. One of us walks away and says, fuck, I should have fucking plowed him man. I should have fucking told that fuck. And the next thing you know, you have a drink. Because you're pissed off, so you have a couple of drinks. What happens when you run into the guy again? Still mad. Yeah, you're still mad. But this time you're going to do something about it. Because you got the, you got the courage. You got the courage in your, in your tummy there. Eh? So you're going, to, you're going to respond. So 99% of the guys are in prison because they got into a fight when they were drinking. Alcohol was a factor. What we do as Anishinaabe people is we think in words. If you're a, a speaker of Ojibwe language, a lot of times you only, even if you're just a Anishinaabe person, with the atavistic astopic, knowledge of being able to speak in word, in word, in pictures. Anytime you speak, a person can literally picture what you're saying in Ojibwe because our whole language is all in pictures. When I uh, say uh, a dog is just sprawled up there, you know, and everything, I say that dog is just, that dog is just laying there. But in Ojibwe, you say, it's like the dog is just lifeless, <laughs> just threw himself, it looks like somebody just threw him there. And that's what you're saying in Ojibwe. So if you speak Ojibwe, you say, picture comes right immediately into your mind. You've spoken pictures. And you laugh because that's exactly what the dog looks like, what you just finished saying. Right. So we're great, we're great at being able to talk in pictures. When you are addicted to pain and you're a young guy, what you usually do is you always paint pictures. If you're addicted to pain, you see uh, you, uh, what happens to a lot of these guys is they're in prison and they can't find some, they can't get a hold of their anybody in their home. They can't hold, get a hold of their partner. They've asked to use the phone, they can't get a hold of the partner. So the first thing that comes to their mind is they're in a place where they've got no control over anything. And they think, well, geez, you know, 
I wonder if she's. I wonder if she's gone somewhere. I wonder if she's gone to a party. They phone at night, uh, afternoon. Is I bet you she's gone party. Next thing you know, they say, "Well, I bet she's gone partying with so and so." So what they do is they come to the phone. They ask if they're going to use the phone again, and the person will say, "Yeah, okay, well, use the phone, but make make it fast." So they be on the phone and. And, uh, oh, yeah, she's home this time. So she answers the phone and says, well, hi, hon, how are you doing? Where were you? And she says, oh, I was up at my aunt's. Oh, yeah, okay, well. Hey, let me talk to one of the kids. The kid comes on the phone. Hi, honey. Gee, Daddy misses you. Jeez. I hear you guys weren't home last night. I know we weren't. Said, Where were you? No, oh, we were at, uh, down at uh, downtown and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, who was all there? The, the kid becomes the messenger to the picture this guy wants to paint. Mm. So the more displacement and the more hurt he puts into this picture, the more his body builds up, psyching himself right out. Pictures come into his mind of her being with somebody else. And, uh, oh, that, it's starting to hurt just perfect now. Oh, jeez. And he paints it more, even more with her in the bedroom. Oh, my God. It's starting to hurt just right. So he keeps on re redoing it. He, paints, he finds a picture that's going through his mind that's perfect. So what he does is he plays it, and it rewinds it, plays again, rewinds it, plays again. It goes right into the pain that he wants to experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, He's getting his rocks off of his pain picture he's painting for. So there he goes. Next thing you know, he's got to act out the feeling he's having. So he hits the brew that's being made inside the prison, and uh, then the next thing you know, he's going through this breaking up with his woman and everything. This, me, I come along, put my circle, put him in my circle, and I say, hey, how you doing? He says, ah, I don't want to talk right now. Says, oh, here we go. I says, what's going on? He says, ah, things are just ain't good. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about it. He says, oh yeah. So I said, well, you know, uh, probably you'll, you'll probably really enjoy this next time I'm going to talk about it. And I talk about what I just finished talking about. And he goes, ah, fuck, that creep. That really fucking pisses me off. Why don't you talk about something else? And I says, uh, hey, tell me something. When you're out there with your woman, did you mess around once in a while? He says, yeah, well, yeah, I did. Yeah, but that's different. I said, no, no, it is. Jeez, I said, I'll tell you what. You know, I said, isn't payback a fucking bitch, though? He says, ah! <laughs> <laughs> and the guys, the guys, they respond to that. And they say, well, you know, I actually almost thought you were talking about me. Were you talking about him? I said, no, no, I said... I'm talking about the symptom symptomology of possessiveness. I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the symptomology of a, an addict trying to control something that he cannot control. He does not know that he doesn't know how to control, except he thinks he can control. He's inside here in prison trying to control behavior that's happening outside of prison. How fucking insane is that? Yeah, that is fucking stupid, isn't it? <laughs> so, the... the, the, the the program gets starting to rip, and the guys are starting to say, yeah, well, I don't know, man. I, I get pissed off sometimes, too, but, uh, yeah, I don't get that pissed off. I just go out and get even. And they say, what, you got a boyfriend in here? <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes our, our conversations get pretty pretty hyper and everything, but there's the medicines and there's the pipe. And most of the guys, they say, okay, well, I'm going to cool it in because I've got to have respect for the pipe. I have respect for the other guys here. and uh, It's been, what, 21 years in that group? I've never had an incident. I get guys jumping up and hitting the walls. Boom, boom. Ouch. I say, okay, let it out, man, let it out. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But the guy goes back and he's, you know, he's calm, mm -hmm. straightened out. You know? Did you ever see that movie, uh, Once for Warriors? No. i got to get a hold of that movie. I want to show you that. I'll tell you exactly what I'm talking about. I'll get that movie. Okay. They almost they tried to fire me from Rainbow Lodge because I used that movie. And, uh, the, my supervisor told me, you're fired. And talk to the director right now. So the director called me in his office. He said, I hear you're showing a very violent movie. In you. Uh, yeah, I was. And he says, um, do I know anything about it? Do I know that, book? Do I know that movie? I says, I don't know. I said, have you ever watched Once for Warriors? He said, no. He says, you want to go and try, you want to watch it at home? Yeah. He says, I'd like to watch that because somebody really, really doesn't want you watching sh showing that in the film. So he took it home. You know, I'm going to go to the board about this. I, you should be fired. 
okay. And I go to the board. And so he took it to the board. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> one of the, Ronnie Wakagizu, he was the chief at the time. One of the best chiefs they ever had in Wiki. And he said, and he, I guess he, uh, they went and seen him. And he said, well, you know, it's been a totally different program since Lorne Bob took over. And there's been a lot of guys that sobered up since he's been here. I would have to go and see and talk to him myself. So he came and looked for me and he says, what's, what's going on with this movie? He says, what, how come you're showing that? And I said, well, it's, I said, it's about the best trigger film I've ever seen. I said, especially when you sm smudge down, and smudge yourself. One of our biggest problems among, among our people is how we treat our women and how our women treats us. And I said, so I, I use that as a trigger film because it shows exactly how we are in First Nations, some of us, and how some of us behave. And uh, he says, yeah? I said, yeah. So why, why are you traumatizing these when every other treatment program and uh, native program, they really, really watch that they don't traumatize anybody? And I says, I says, I know that. I said, but you're going in the wrong direction. In order to be able to help somebody, you have to walk them through the trauma, be there to walk them through that trauma. Because if you guard them from that trauma, the next time they run into that trauma and run into that trigger thing on the, in the community, what happens to them? Is why well, they go crazy. And I say, yeah. Because there's nobody around that knows what's happening to them to be able to talk them through that. Mm -hmm. I said, so it's one of the most true one of the most influential programs, movies that I've ever sh uh, seen. I said, it's the best thing I've ever seen in my life. And I said, that's why they get to see it. And I said, then they, then they look at it and it's holy smoke, you know. I've done that, holy fuck. And when the women said, that fucking bastard, you know, I, I've had that happen to me, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, it, uh, it really freaking opens guys red, you know. And, and uh, and I'm there to uh, to make sure that they're going to be okay. And uh, because people, the the big deal was you got to put these guys through the, the program, but you got to make sure you don't traumatize anybody. Because you trauma them, you hit them, you hurt them spiritually. Your spirit cannot be hurt if your mind can heal. Mm -hmm. So they uh, hung on to me and told me to to continue using the program. And they said, Why do you have the sacred fire? Says to help these people that get traumatized taken to the secret fire. I says, I'm doing things that were done 300 years ago. I said, we didn't have people traumatized 300 years ago because they had a secret fire to go to, and that's why we... Uh, so after that, nowadays, well, at least 10 years ago, anyway, this happened about uh, 1993, but I almost lost my job over that. 1994, I think. When it first came out, 1994, I think that's when it started. Uh, from that time on, until about six months later to a year later, every treatment center in Ontario was using that as a trigger. Even non-native people were using it. Mm -hmm. So I was one of the first people that was using it. Right. Because yeah, I saw, there we go, that's what I've been looking for. Ah, uh, right. I don't know. Yeah. I might be off topic again. <laughs> well, it's funny because, like, uh, that kind of impact that ongoing impact that we all have is kind of captured in the next question uh -huh. uh, because the next question talks about talks about vision like you had the vision to use this this video mm -hmm. in a good way so same thing um, what is your vision for indigenous education over the <coughs> next 10 years I think a lot of people that are heading in that direction now, I don't think I'd be the only one doing that, but I saw, as an example, 150,000 kids having their language taken away from them. And I saw 150,000 kids being taught how to hurt people because the way that the army trains killers in the army, they use discipline, and they use discipline with a low. They use discipline in a very harsh way. You follow the command, under no circumstances do you disobey. It makes you separate from your spirit to be able to do something that's totally alien to you. So that's how our kids were being taught, discipline without love. The other part was correction through shame. You should be ashamed of yourself. 
you're going to go to hell. You should be ashamed of yourself because if you leave here and go back to your parents who are nothing but drunks and heathen, that's where we're going to send you. 150,000 kids came back, became adults, and raised their kids. Correction through shame. You should be ashamed of yourself. We never knew that word before that. You should be ashamed of yourself. We never used that. So on top of that, you had 150,000 kids that walked away from their language, picked up a language that was about 500 years old with about seven different languages in it. They used seven, about seven other different languages to put that English together. Mm. It wasn't a pure language. And uh, they were still using, they were still learning how to use the new words that had been put into our language. We had a language that was 13,000 years old, that's the youngest it could have been. 13,000 years of knowledge intertwined, embedded right into that language, saying things that you could not say in translation, that had total, total meaning. You had uh, the understanding of respect, the understanding of how to use energy. We lived in ceremony. Like me, I was raised in ceremony. I couldn't whistle after dark. My grandmother used to say, unless you want to call Sabe after you, you don't whistle. Okay, you don't want to see that big gun, man. You don't catch me with them. We're yelling outside after dark. Don't sing while you're eating, unless you want to give your food away to the spirits. No, I don't think so. Because when you're singing, that means you're inviting the spirits to eat with you. You're going to eat what's in front of you. And what you're going to eat is food that's had the spirit taken out of it. Because the spirits have taken the spirit of that. So you don't do it. So you're, you're literally living in ceremony. Because eating is part of the ceremony because Chibapwe, the word cook in our language, what they use the word cook, Chibapwe. Chibapwe means preparation for spirits. That's what Chibapwe means. That's uh, the preparation for ghosts, uh, preparation for the dead. That's what Chibapwe means. So you're cooking in preparation of feeding the spirits, the dead ones. And... Um, so you're living in ceremony, even when you're cooking, it's a ceremony that you're doing. Um, in the eating, it's a ceremony that you're doing. You're breaking, you're breaking your fast when you eat. Uh, the act of uh, hunting, you pray, you stop and pray before you shoot. And you shoot so you don't, you don't hurt that animal. You don't abuse that animal. Again, when you're skinning the deer, or the moose, or whatever animal you're cooking, you pray again to the spirit of this being. This again, when you're cooking, you pray again. Again, before you eat, you say, oh, so admission. You pray four times before you actually ingest that, that animal, that food. After you finish eating, it was my job after we finish eating to go and take the bones outside and put them in a tree so that other animals could come and pick on them, pick at them, and feed themselves, have respect for those bones. Because the animals see you have respect for their bones, they won't, they're not going to be afraid to come to you. They'll come to you. When you're hungry, they'll come to you. Those are all ceremonies, the way that they, they raised me to live. So that's how, uh, that's how I was raised, and to live in ceremony, to, uh, to pray, uh, to speak. Uh, when I was uh, uh, gathering uh, and hauling water, Again, you're living in spirit. You're taught that uh, water becomes pure when you put it aside and you pray to it. Your water is becoming pure. And, uh, you're, um, you know, it's, uh, it's not so much that it, it's, it's not so much that you're stopping to do all this stuff. You're, you're praying as you're going through this. You're in ceremony as you're going through your everyday thing. Mm -hmm. you're, um, when you're picking blueberries, you're learning about four different things when you pick blueberries. You're learning to be still, and you're learning to have be persevering. You're under a hot sun and you're picking berries. You're learning patience because there's a big basket here and you're picking a little wee bit at a time. Here. So you're learning perseverance and patience. You're learning how to look for better things in life because you're trying to find a really good patch where you pick more and faster. So you're learning to look for better things in your life. Subliminally, you're doing all this 
in your subconscious. And you're learning all these things. So you're living the ceremony even when you're picking berries, uh, picking different kind of, uh, uh, you know, medicine. When you're picking medicines, you're taught that you have to pray before you touch those medicines. And you're, to, you're taught to pray to the medicine. You're saying, you're, you were put here, Creator put you here to look after me, to look after the people, all my relations, you're told. You're given that message to look after us. So I'm asking you now to look after us. You're speaking directly to those plants. And you know that you prayed for them, and you know that they're going to look after you. No questions or nothing. You know they're going to look after you. That's how you uh, pass your day, because it doesn't seem like you're doing any better until you get older and you say, holy cow, I don't need to go to ceremonies. I lived in ceremonies. You know, my grandmother, I don't know if you've, uh, you've learned this before but through other people, maybe art, but uh, Nishinaabe, that's who we are. And um, we become part of the big secret. Nishinaabe in our language means uh, man lowered here from the stars. That's what Nishinaabe means. The original way of saying that was Nishinaabe. Nis, Nabe, meaning lowered man. We come from the stars. That is what that name implies. So, your great grandmother, my grandmother, when she heard thunder and she saw that lightning flashing and heard that thunder, she used to run for tobacco. Tobacco in the fire and pray. Because she thought that was her relatives coming back to look for her. Because that's what she was told by other people. They said, when, uh, when, when our people come back to look for us, you're going to hear that, see that bright light, and you're going to hear that sound of that, uh, that, flying, uh, that flying house, that flying machine. You're going to hear that. You're going to be a loud noise when it comes into our space. There's going to be a big flash. Then you know our people are coming to get us. So whenever she uh, heard the lightning, she oh, get, get my tobacco. You know? Thousands of years before, when those relatives left us here, that's what they told us. You'll know we're coming, and this is how you'll know we're coming. So all these times, all these years, people prayed. They knew that they hadn't been abandoned here. They knew that somebody's going to come look for us. Mm -hmm. I was 21 years old when I jumped about that big flying saucer, and I knew that I'm going to die. Before. I'm going to see before I die. I've already seen one, but it wasn't too big when I saw one. Already. I've seen three flying saucers with Bobby and uh, Bronson. I saw three flying saucers coming out of Ottawa, or the triangle kind. Eh? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so that's a, we became part of the cover-up. UFOs have been covered up for years and years. The government knows about them and everything. So that's why they don't ever want us to be able to name who we are. If the government always chooses what we're going to be called. We were called natives, Indian, Aboriginal. Now we're called indigenous. It wasn't us that chose that name. As long as we don't call ourselves Nishnabe, that's, that's why. Most people don't even understand what Shaganosh means. We call the white people Shaganosh. Those from offshore. That's how we, that's how we call them. Those from offshore. But very few people know what that, that word means in Shakurash. So uh, we have those names for, they give Wemtigush. Wemtigush uh, means uh, a long time ago when uh, the Jesuits were uh, trying to uh, teach our people about God, about Christ. They'd come too close to a village and Jesuits would be traveling by canoe and they'd, uh, they'd see, they'd see uh, a village up ahead so one of them would go up in front of the canoe and stand there and wave a cross. We have a wooden cross. They thought, well, if you know, we, if we let them see the cross, they'll know we come in peace, so they're not going to hurt us. So they would, one of them would stand out there and wave that cross. And they were French uh, French Jesuits. So we'd look out and we'd see that canoe coming there, and we'd see that funny guy standing out the front waving a stick. <laughs> He's waving away, he was waving a stick there. So that's what we call them, wavers of the stick. So to this day, Web Tigouche, it means waivers of the stick. That's what we call French people, eh? Okay. Waivers of the stick. <laughs>
funny how names happen, eh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So a lot of a lot of those things can be done within ten years. You reckon? I don't know. I'll ask you a question. How do you discipline yourself, or can you, or do you teach yourself how to hold a nine to five job? Like generally, or like me as a person. Generally, it's like it's just the ideas embedded. Like once you're old enough to understand possibility, like what you could do after the fruits of that labor. I guess. Because mm-hmm. uh, like it, it depends on the person, really. Like the the group of people I grew up with would be more not money interested as a motivation, but like I'm doing this because this is what I do. It's not it's not a job, you know. Okay. Like, but this is this is a role I can do, and I'm good at it, and you know, mm-hmm. like right now. If it was possible, I would do what I do for free. Uh-huh. You know, where other people are motivated by a four-car garage, and you know, it's a it's a personal thing, right? Mm-hmm. It's like it's the same reason why I sent Selena on a two-month canoe trip. I figure anybody could do something for thirty days. Every day, it had changed their lives, and they'll never ever be the same again. Mm-hmm. And I um, got her to do it two, ten, two times thirty days. I didn't do that, but I mean, I put her, I put her, and uh, I left her kind of uh, vulnerable to be able to do it because she had to. I, I took her away from. Uh, telephone, took her away from that thing there, took her away from that thing over there, put her into a place where she had to think. Because when you're in the front of a canoe or in the back of a canoe, you're alone. Because if you're in the back of the canoe, the person's back is turned to you, and you're in the front of the canoe, your back is turned to the other person. You're totally alone. I tried to be able to simulate or imitate what I've been through. I try to give my kids what my grandfather gave me. Enough knowledge to be able to write my name. To be able to do something. The reason I the reason I asked that, and you asked you answered the question pretty well, how I saw you. You answered the question how I saw you, how I've seen you since I first ever laid eyes on you. When I first laid eyes on you, I didn't know you were my child. But I knew you were a, a really great person, and I was proud to be able to say hi to you. I don't know what it was, it was just a totally extra big special thing that I found out was that you were my child, because I never I never knew you were even alive anymore. Like, I, I, I heard that you died. But from the first time I saw you, you were different than anybody else, you know. The way that you, the energy that you had, the way that you held yourself, the way you responded, you were um, everything that I probably ever wanted in a child, and uh, I liked you. I didn't. I didn't know who you were. I liked you, and um, you didn't seem like a nine to five. Does that make sense to you? You didn't seem like a nine to five, and you didn't seem to care about impressing anybody but yourself. You were very, very, very centered with your kids. It was unbelievable the things I went through when I did find out. I was shocked because, like I said, even CAS had told me you died, and I thought, "Wow, how could that be? How could, how could, uh, how could, uh, how could Chas be my kid? He's gone." Uh, because it takes you a while to, even when you're drinking, it takes you a long time to, to let go of somebody and um, to uh, visualize. It was, it was actually Paula, Frida first. I think I told you that. Peter told me, I think that new kid in town could be your kid. 
And I said, oh yeah. I kind of blew her away because, no, that's impossible. How could that be? And then I guess Frida talked to Paula, and Paula, she's very, very observant. And um, she, uh, we were at a Christmas, I think it was a Christmas party at the complex. Paula was there, and uh, she saw you crossing the floor, and she says, you know, that is your boy. I said, ah, go on. I said, no, no, that's your boy. I said, what makes you say that anyways, Maddie? Said, what makes you say that anyway? And she says, well, she says, all your kids walk the same way you do. She says, Bronson, James, even though he's not yours, but uh, Bronson and Lori, for, for, for sure, they both walk the same way. And uh, she says, even the ones that aren't your kids that you raised, they walk like you. And I said, yeah. She said, yeah. That's, she said, that's your son. I, said, I don't know. But I believed her, eh? And I said, holy cow, that's, that's strange. So that's when we, I think it was a little, long, long, little, little time after that, we started talking and that. And then I started to understand, yeah, holy cow, somebody lied to me. But that's where the nine to five thing comes in. You're not a nine to five. And I was so sure that I'm training a person with that in mind. Polly, she just signed up a person. She, uh, uh, she, one of her downlines was going to quit on her yesterday. And that person took another look at her, uh, her program that she's on in here and she decided she's going to stay on but she's so sure of it now she's going to sign somebody else on so all the training I've put into Holly mm -hmm. is starting to come into fruition because I told Holly you're not a 9 to 5 I said and you're not meant to be paid by the hour I said you're meant to have freedom in your life and I said I can teach you how to do that yeah. so she's on her way <laughs> yeah because it'll uh It'll, uh, it'll give me residual income. If I can train people like that, about three, four other people like that, I'll have residual income. I'll replace my income within another year. Okay. I'll be able to go live in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Where the real medicine is. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why, that's why I said, well, when you talk about 10 years, it depends on where people are going to start. It depends, like our reserve. Our reserve is so far into the, the left side, do they ever want to do that? They can't see what I see. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of them can see what I see. But don't forget, I was raised in it, mm -hmm. raised in ceremony and everything. And I've, uh, I've got a pretty good education. Grade eight's not bad. Yeah, I've done more with grade eight than most people have done with a fucking college, a college diploma just in the studying that I've done, the books I've read. Unbelievable. Uh, to be able to find out about uh, uh, treatment and how to, how to be able to go in the opposite direction in treatment, to have that faith to do that. I took at least 10, uh, 10 psychology books, reading front to back, to have that courage to be able to do that. And plus the teachings of my grandfather. And I can to, that's why I'm trying to put that book together. I'll give you some example of something I got some over here, just to give you an idea. Remembering the dream. They say that when we are on Mother Earth, we are actually experiencing everything in a dream. So when we dream, we are in a dream within a dream. My first recollection of my dream was in a trapper's cabin. I must have been two and a half years old. I was sitting in a cabin in the glow of a lamplight. My grandma was making moccasins and telling me a story. It was winter time and very cold outside. The smell of wood burning in the stove and the sweet smell of smoke tan leather is forever ingrained in my mind, in my memory. And also the howling of the wolves talking to the moon helped me help make the cabin feel safe and cozy. My life at the time was very simple and exciting. Some evening my grandma my grandpa came in the cabin in the evening, driving daylight, d d d diving daylight, mm -hmm. okay. and sometimes I came, he came in after dark. As I stated earlier, I was two and a half years old and already had a, a routine and a menu for each day. My day started by uh, putting on my foot, my footwear and going outside to check uh, on the weather every morning because that's what my grandpa did. I was having a wonderful life with my grandparents and my dog pal. 
when you are small and the two people is all you're uh, aware of, you don't miss anyone. And the three of you plus dog is all you know. You're never lonely or bored. As I said earlier, life is exciting. I had a routine. I was two and a half years old and I dressed myself. I had my custom-made grandma woolen socks, custom-made thick woolen cap and scarf, my winter boots were with snap-shut uh, buckles that fit perfect, wool pants with suspenders, winter jacket made out of smoked tanned leather, deer's hide, lined with fox fur or rabbit fur, custom-fitted long johns. My grandma said the clothes had to fit right so that they would be warm. When we traveled, I was fitted into a beaver fur homemade bag. I was better equipped than just about any <coughs> anyone whose picture I saw much later on in a kids' magazine, in Eaton's catalog. I had two toys, a homemade sock doll that I shared with uh, my custom-made bed and a homemade uh, airplane made out of wood, birch bark, and cord cardboard. I had a little cover with my emergency rations, custom made, of course. It contained raisins, hard candy, maple sugar hard candy, a big can of honey, and apples. My travel sleigh was made of seasoned dry cedar with ash runners for speed. It also came with a dog harness so Pal could pull me on the ice. I also had my own uh, miniature axe, just like Grandpa's. I don't remember, but my grandma told me that I had told her that I had to have an axe so I could help split wood <laughs> two and a half years old. <laughs> For the trapping season, we lived in a trapper's cabin in Shackwall Lake. At the time, I knew the area as a Shkokwagma uh, on end, end of the lake. Our cabin was a log cabin about uh, 16 feet by 20 feet, and it uh, had one room, a very homey, comfortable place to hang out. I had a little bed that must have been five feet long and three feet wide. It was laid out with a feather mattress and a feather blanket with a woolen top cover. I didn't know it at the time, but I was a very comfortable and safe kid, and my grandparents were sober, <coughs> hard-working people. I don't know how lucky I was because drunkenness and alcoholism was the identity of my people at the time. We weren't allowed off the reserve to work or allowed to hunt or on most reserves. My grandparents weren't what you were considered civilized, which meant they still looked at the land as theirs and no one had the right to tell them where to live or work. And really no one had the right to own land but here, put here by the Creator. Yeah. But some place, uh, some, some place would be different. I, I see um, a lot of our um, natural resources are going to be going from the reserve. I, I, I didn't believe one. Well, somebody told me that they're selling uh, pickerel on the reserve. I didn't believe that until I walked into Bobby's there one day. Yeah, they're selling pickerel on the reserve. So, and, and then when uh, um, it was uh, <coughs> one of my white friends that was telling me that Bobby had uh, taken 24 pickerel in a week out of uh, out of uh, Vermaine River Vermaine River Bridge and taking a net and taking 2,400 over 2,400 people and I said that, that's impossible I said how could people how could the people in Norton allow him to do something I mean, holy catfish it's, how is my grandkids going to learn how to fish my grandkids will never know what it feels like to go and catch a pickerel with a spear and sit by the campfire and cook because it wasn't fucking mm. <laughs> I think we're done. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we covered a lot of a lot of ground there. At first I thought, oh, this looks like we're going to be done in like 40 minutes. But then uh, <laughs> we got into some good some good sharings there for sure, so thank you.